Hi there, it's Jacek Bartosiak. Uh, welcome to Strategy in Future. And today uh, uh, with Nicholas Myers, we'll be talking about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, Jacek? Quite fine. Quite fine, but uh, didn't sleep well this night. But maybe I will disclose more about that during our talk. Uh, so let's get started, Nick. So uh, we are talking and recording this conversation on the 18th of March in the morning, uh, 9, uh, 9 a.m. Warsaw time, so 10 a.m. Uh, Kiev time, Kiev time. So uh, just tell me what has happened over the last uh, days since we last talked that is of critical importance or you'd like to draw attention to. So yes, this war is now stumbling into the fourth week um, here in March. And we've seen that the line, the front lines are in some places getting a bit more static and in other places going back and forth uh, with quite a lot of rapidity. So just in the past day, been, there's been unconfirmed talk of the Ukrainians pushing the Russians back out of Mykolaiv Oblast almost completely back towards Kherson. Um, I don't think that I find that especially surprising. I expect the road between those two cities to be exchanged a lot, considering how easy it is to go on the offensive in Western Ukraine. This is, of course, west of the Dnieper. Uh, near, on the key front northwest of the city, I'll just point out the maps so people can follow along for this first part. So that the report is that the Ukrainians have pushed back on the road back into the Kherson Oblast area here. In Kyiv itself, the line has not moved terribly far from where we were last time, though it certainly is looking as though the Ukrainians are winning a variety of tactical confrontations and even taking back a couple of towns. Um, so the main difficulty the Russians seem to be having is that they control, well, at least they did control everything beyond the European River here, this blue line. And so they were based around Hostomil and Bucha, and they kept trying to break out across the river, but they would never make it especially far. The Ukrainians would be able to destroy whatever bridge or pontoon crossing they were setting up. And then even if on the set random occasions where the Russians did manage to get across the river uh, for some period of time, they have an extremely difficult time then driving through this heavily forested terrain where they really have to move along the roads. Uh, there's been a couple of discussions in the past 48 hours among Ukrainians that the Russians are trying to carve their way through the forests. Uh, if that's the case now, then it's going to be a very long slog indeed. And it's going to be a similar story that we haven't gotten to that point on the eastern side uh, of Ukraine. So this whole area around Brovary, a lot of these towns are now being exchanged with the Russians. Uh, though the pace the, in the early phase of the war, when whenever a BTG equivalent, uh, I say BTG equivalent because the Ukrainians are still calling them that the Russians are not actually fighting as battalion tactical groups, they have basically the equipment of one. Um, whenever one would get to one of these towns outside, they'd immediately attack and then they'd be able to be repulsed. So now the Russians are definitely waiting on the outside and doing a lot more strikes to soften this area up. But as a result, since they're coming along, not a line from the north, where the Chernogov battle is still raging, but coming all the way from the Sumy Oblast along the main highways here, um, it takes a long time to reinforce. And so they're more in a holding position for now, uh, coupled with the problem that even if they did manage to win a major tactical victory at Bovari, they then have access to this other big force, uh, which is going to be another choke point as they try to enter into the city of Kiev itself. Uh, in the north, the Battle of Chernogov continues to go, and as we've said before, it's definitely a heroic stand that the Ukrainians are making. Uh, there's been a variety of, a, a, of attempts by the Russians to uh, create a pontoon bridge over the Desna River, which uh, you had mentioned towards the beginning of the war. Regardless of whenever where it started, they're certainly attempting to do so now. The Russians are in control of most of these towns intermittently. Uh, so some of the towns closer to Kiev, they have a more permanent presence, but a lot of these places, they send columns through. Occasionally, they get harassed by Ukrainian territorial fighters in the back, uh, seeming to affirm the harassment zone theory that we have been discussing with the new model army, because it's quite difficult for the Ukrainians to maintain artillery bombardment of the areas around Kiev 
uh, if they can't keep a constant flow of logistics to these front points. Which is why over the past couple of days, or the past week basically, the strikes in Kyiv have resumed being primarily air delivered. Uh, since the Russians aren't so much interested in precision strikes except against very specific targets like television towers and airports, uh, they're resorting to a lot more just sort of dumb bombs and other uh, unsophisticated missiles that are launched by air to do the actual bombardment of the residential buildings that we read so much about in the news. Uh, so not that that's a comfort in any way, but it does show that um, if you had air defense sufficient to turn Kyiv into a no-fly zone, then you'd probably be spared most of the damage currently coming into the town. Not all, but most. Kyiv's unfortunately quite close to Belarus and therefore easy to target, um, even if you can't get all the air in it that you want. So Chernigov's in threat of being encircled at pretty much any time. Uh, at various points, it seems to be so. Uh, the discussion I've seen seems to be that the pontoon crossings are happening mostly around this town of Oster, but it's, it's not appearing to succeed long enough for uh, the Russians to get a major motion across. They keep getting uh, taken out by the Ukrainians at some point sooner or later. And what the Russians really need is to open up Chernigov's uh, transit point so that they can fuel whatever logistics are necessary consistently down. And the, to and the first brigade in Chernigov really put up put up a major, you know, fight, uh, the stubborn defense. So, do we know anything more in detail about their, you know, stance there? We don't know anything definitively because the um, the only news we get about tactical exchanges occur when the Ukrainians tell us that they liberated a town or two or that uh, they acknowledged the loss of some major city, which as I understand only in the past week, only Volnovacha has been in the Donetsk area has been um, acknowledged as properly lost by the Ukrainians. But we do occasionally hear about the um, Ukrainians retaking a couple of towns, especially on the north side of the uh, north side of the city. Uh, intermittently, we've seen reports of the Russians breaking through into a number of these western suburbs, but for the most part, the battle in Chernigov has been characterized publicly uh, by overnight bombings of towns in order to force all of the civic defenses to repair them or put out fires, um, and then not much detail about how the literal engagements on the front are functioning. We do know that the Russians are attempting to advance along this road, this road, and this road, and possibly this road, though it's a bit, a bit more unclear. Um, so they're surrounded on multiple sides. We also know that pretty, pretty much every town on the southern end of the river, of the Desna River up here has been at least transited by the Russians, probably with a minimal Russian presence in order to ensure that the Ukrainian resupply isn't coming through. So anything up there that the Ukrainians have is pretty much what they've got. But still, we, we don't know the, the logistical or tactical details that much clarity, mostly for OPSEC purposes, I'm sure. But it's been interesting. Uh, it's it's it certainly seems as though the tempo of the fighting in that area has declined considering the relative disappearance of claims of post-battle victories that the Ukrainians were very big on in the second week of the war, which would suggest the Russians are more massing for something in the future as opposed to continuously striking as they did in the first week. So the only other practical point I would I would add is that uh, the Kharkov encirclement really is not panning out. The Russians continue to make advances along this area southeast of Kharkov and have reached the Donetsk River in a variety of places. There's big battles going on at Izium, which is, of course, a major transit point across the river. But um, this is still inconclusive, lots of civilian withdrawals, but still... This whole area is kind of frozen in the meantime, just turning into a gigantic casualty, ca casualty causing slog, which is turning into a real humanitarian crisis, but not yet into a major breakout. And on the Donbass front, it's still somewhat, it's been um, slow going, but still moving, I would say, over the past week. The Russians have made um, 
the Russians have basically taken this whole corner and are now besieging Rybnitsa and Sovyetodonetsk pretty heavily on a day-by-day basis. But there's been no movement, again, across this major forested area. They're more just trying to beat them into submission. Sovyetodonetsk is the current uh, capital of the Ukrainian-controlled Luhansk Oblast. So presumably there would be a larger collapse of the Luhansk front if it fell. Um, in the south, Mariupol continues to hold out. It's still not entirely clear how consistent Russian control of an area surrounding it is. Uh, they, I've been getting more civilians out this week. So humanitarian corridors function. Sometimes it appears that they just get through. Um, but it, it's definitely true that Mariupol is effectively cut off from whatever resupply is going to come in. The utilities have been down for a while now. And it's really just the Marines, uh, the Azov Regiment, and a couple of National Guard units that are just going to hold it out to the end. It certainly seems like, as uh, uh, Doc Carver has been t- was telling you earlier. Um, and then elsewise, perhaps the most interesting development over the past over the past week has been that though the front line moving out of Kherson to Zaporozhye has not really moved. Um, there's been some interesting activities going on across the Kherson Oblast, this, is, this whole region down here, directly across from Crimea. So I believe on Tuesday, the Russians announced that they were in 100% control of the Oblast. And we started getting some messages from Ukrainian politicians saying that it's quite imminent that the Russians will be attempting to create uh, a Kherson People's Republic, so a new separatist unit down in the south. Uh, it's quite well publicized how the mayor of Melitopol here was kidnapped, uh, I believe on Monday, I might be either Monday or Saturday, I might be forgetting which, which specific day, but he was kidnapped, resurfaced later saying that he was officially deposed, but he's not giving up. And we've seen a couple of other lesser actions going on in Verdyansk and a number of the other towns as well. The locals continue to protest on an almost daily basis against the occupation So the Russians have been really stepping up uh, their imposition of martial law against these. We haven't seen too much uh, video recording of like violent suppression. We have seen quite a few kidnappings and just arrests off the street by uh, various occupation forces. We've also heard some details about Rosgvardia taking over the occupation of some of these rear areas as well. Um, And that's probably the last interesting tactical note to go over is that we're seeing a better, we're seeing a bit more details from the Russian side about the distribution of tasks. In particular, they've been putting out a lot of information about why the VDV actually has been winning all these glorious battles here, there, and everywhere in order to counteract the Western narrative that they really lost in the early days of the war, which I don't think is unjustified. I think the VDV did... uh, I became at least disappointed. I think they were overly ambitious with some of their early things, uh, which is why we shouldn't read it as too much of a disaster, but the Russians are really trying to counteract that narrative. And secondly, we've seen General Zolotov, the um, leader of Rosquardia and Putin's former bodyguard, really coming out in defense of the performance of his forces to date which does suggest that he at least is at least marginally frustrated with the messaging coming out of Moscow and the decisions to sometimes put forces under his command on the front line, which is really not what they're trained for. Uh, But there seems to be increasing. They are apparently short of the infantry and the Russians are short of infantry to control. On basically all fronts, I would say that. We've heard a couple of people saying that there just are not enough Russian soldiers to maintain an occupation or maintain the pressure at various points. And I think to a certain extent, that's explainable by the fact that Ukraine's just huge. And even though they're only really striking into uh, maybe one quarter of the territory so far, Ukraine's a very big place and they're trying to move at a lot of fronts. So yeah, there's some serious manpower problems on the Russian side. And we've heard rumors that there's uh, university students in Russia being kicked out in order to be conscriptable and uh, various other ways of just drumming up large scale mobilization. I haven't seen any significant confirmation of those things, but I would not be terribly surprised if that's- But the, dra- by the spring draft is occurring on, the, on April 1st, so it's soon, right? 
Yes, April 1st is the traditional start of the spring draft. So presumably there'll be some movement relatively fast, though I, th- I have seen that the Russians are taking considerable internal uh, political pushback for the fact that conscripts are being sent to the front um, for all the traditional reasons. It's not paid very well and they're not expecting to go into an active war. So, especially since this Russian television is telling them that there are no conscripts at the front and anybody that is there is, should, needs to be investigated uh, for inappropriate behavior. So we may see some uh, relaxation of that in the coming weeks, but honestly, I don't think that a new conscript drive by itself, if conducted in the same way that the, uh, they typically are, is going to save that particular problem. But that's my highlight of the tactical points going on. So what, what is your assessment in terms of what, because I, I'm of the opinion that the critical thing is what are the Russians are up to now? Since they uh, apparently, their plan of the quick maneuver uh, warfare that would solve the political problem and create a political s- solution to the, uh, to the Ukraine, the question of Ukraine, it has collapsed. So the, the whole concept has collapsed. Uh, they're short of the man, of manpower. The, they apparently are short of fuel. They have problems with logistics that manifested themselves in the first two weeks of the war. And it looks like an operational pause. So what do you think they are up to? What they are thinking? Because it may go in a completely opposite ways. You know, either the position, positional warfare or a major push, depending, of course, on the military strength that they could uh, master. Yeah. So what is your guess? What do you think? What is your assessment? So to date... And, and sorry, and how would you calibrate it with a, some viable political objective? A new one, a right. new center of gravity, because the, the, the center of gravity so, forth, so far has sort of, you know, collapsed. I mean, so, they, they didn't make it. So to date, I would say, I'd say there's at least four possibly more operational phases that we've seen already. Uh, The first one uh, of using maneuver to just shock people into presence, that clearly failed by the end of day two. I would say there's even a distinction between day one and day two, where by day two, they recognize they needed to resort much more to DRGs in order to uh, destabilize the enemy defenses. And even that failed as well. Then things moved on to the next phase. In the second phase, um, I think we really tried to see, can they overwhelm the front by just causing Ukrainian institutions to collapse through uh, mass attack uh, is effectively what it came down to. So they were redividing forces and moving along different portions. That lasted over the course of that weekend. Uh, Obviously, the war started on a Thursday. So by Saturday to sometime early the next week, that was the second major phase of trying to just overwhelm it through force. Uh, And that's when we were really seeing that Zelensky was declaring every day is the most significant day of the conflict. And to a certain extent, I'd say that that was true until the end of that week. Uh, After that, the Ukrainians, sorry, the Russians changed tactics again towards deliberately attempting to seize key infrastructure points. So that's when we really start to see that even behind the front lines, uh, the Russians were starting to move towards the towns where the power plants and the water facility, water treatment facilities, all sorts of other major infrastructure points were. That is when we start to see the inner battle of Yenergodar, so the seizure of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, which culminated at pretty much the end of the second week. Um, and into the beginning of this current week. Since about the transition to this new phase that's, that came in, started around, it seems Saturday, last Saturday the, the 12th, and uh, was definitely in full speed by the 14th, so this Monday. Uh, and that is the Russians decided that any additional infrastructure that they were going for uh, it was probably beyond the reach of an immediate push, as well as the fact that the Ukrainian state is now too resilient to be expected to break imminently. So they've really switched to destroying infrastructure that they don't currently hold. 
So you've seen a lot more strikes on TV towers across Western Ukraine, a lot more just attempts to obliterate real uh, airports that previously they had been attempting to capture, uh, including the one uh, at Vezel Kiev, south of Kiev, that they tried to seize for a couple of days during the mass during the mass section of, uh, during phase two of the war, um, as well as destruction of some of the key infrastructure that Putin had uh, called out before the war started. So we saw some pretty serious strikes on all of the Antono facilities around Kiev, for example, because uh, among other things, they were, the Russians were claiming that there was a lot of logistics build up there. So at the moment, and at this whole most newest phase is complemented by the fact that when Russian forces arrive at the front, they no longer automatically attack. So now there's much more concentration at points. Uh, so I would say an operational pause is the right way to is the right way to phrase this. I don't think it's also a coincidence that as we switched into phase four, we're seeing the Ukrainians say that the diplomatic talks that have been going on sporadically through this are having a lot more of uh, a few more breakthroughs, uh, specifically moving towards uh, trying to find a permanent status of Ukraine as a neutral state that won't be attacked, that's relatively demilitarized, uh, which would have uh, external guarantors, which I think is unworkable for a variety of reasons that we can go into next. But still, it seems that there's a lot more common ground to be found there all of a sudden. I personally am on the side that this is intended to buy time before we move towards phase five. What I think phase five is going to be is unfortunately rather depressing. Um, the lessons that appear to have been gained uh, over phase two and three are that frontal attacks don't work along lines that are consistent. And so the, at the end of phase three, moving into phase four, we saw the Russians expand the front and the only place where they have expanded it since about since the first weekend really and that's to, to move into Karastyan in Zhitomir Oblast for a very simple purpose to gain control of a rail link between Belarus and the front line that they had at Hostomiel northwest of Kiev because uh, currently there is no way to resupply that area northwest of Kiev by rail which is why we saw these giant uh, lines of trucks uh, that were break down, they would run out of gas. So they needed to keep something. So they need to sustain the Russian presence uh, quite close to the capital uh, in order to maintain the political pressure, especially before the Provadri front was set up uh, a couple of days later. So what this sounds remarkably like the lessons that the Russians were learning at the end of 1941, when officers under heavy pressure from the Soviet government to stop the Nazi offensive and begin to attack would simply just turn their forces around and attempt to run at the enemy. And it took quite a bit of uh, finding better officers after the purge the end of that year to reinstate the notion that you don't just attack where you see where the enemy is. Uh, you attack in a way that prevents them from being able to uh, capitalize on the operational situation subsequently. So the Russian armed forces, told me by a good colleague of mine, have always not necessarily prioritized tactical victories if they can win something on the operational level that, that puts the enemy into a much worse position. So in theory, you could have, you could be losing tactical battles around Kiev where the Ukrainians are retaking towns, but if the result is that that moves all the Ukrainian forces into a position where they are winning, but you've now taken control of the logistical lines into Kyiv, then that would be a victory in the long in the long run, even though you haven't necessarily won anything at the tactical level. Um, but we have really not seen much exploitation of that. There was one attempt that's still going at a half speed, you might say. Uh, around the Makariv area, Let's show the screen again. Around the Makariv area, south of Bucha, or southwest of Bucha, where the Russians have been attempting to do a larger scale encirclement of Kiev from the west, but this never got, uh, this never became especially thick. The border of Yanka seems to be the main uh, logistical point that the Russians have set up intermittently. Um, it never got especially far, though they were clearly aiming for Fastiv to cut off the uh, rail line here. And the Ukrainians have continuously counterattacked 
at this point. And uh, we're even getting uh, entertaining stories about how some of the old medieval uh, mound defenses in this area are impervious to tanks. And so medieval defenses are holding up against the uh, Russian movement to try to move around where the Ukrainian defenders now are in that area. But if this, if the Russian commanders had been competent of the way that they ultimately became in the 1940s, then they would have ensured that the Ukrainian counterattack would have come somewhere less uh, decisive and then been able to move along this point. So that even if they were losing engagements somewhere else along the front, if they've now cut off Kiev's access to the West, uh, then the battle would move along. So my suspicion is that phase five coming up is going to see a lot more of that. A bit more flexibility in terms of letting the Ukrainians win at various points, but a lot more attempt to seize key logistical nodes. The difficulty is I think the Ukrainians are now in a much better position to defend those logistical nodes. And so attempting to take them is really going to require considerably more strike power in advance of those attacks in a way that it's unclear the Russians can currently sustain. So my suspicion is that this operational pause going on right now is probably going to last for a couple of weeks while they reconstitute the appropriate rail networks and move all of the um, fires that they require. So, so, so Nick, you think that they are still determined to win this war and that they are just simply want to amass more of logistical uh, train and connectivity and uh, materials and they want to make final push against the key nodes of infrastructure so that to constrain the Ukraine military movement, so to speak, and, and score the major victory and to break through the stalemate that is being witnessed now, right? I still think that if they have any political sense, which Russian generals don't necessarily have to have that, uh, that's what they're aiming for. Because these political settlements I've heard discussion about uh, I think are completely untenable, and we can go in. We can go into that now if you want. Yeah, I, I would. But the last question yeah. uh, on operational and military, uh, the you know dimension. Do you think that the Russians have sufficient? The Russian ground forces uh, have sufficient capacity to deliver this operation phase five, as you you know named it. Uh, it depends on how much shock they can achieve at the beginning. I don't think they're going to be able to achieve it through a simple correlation of forces. I do think that if phase five fails, phase six is going to be just utter annihilation of whatever utilities the Ukrainians have left in order to force the resulting country, whatever that happens to be, to integrate back into uh, a neo-Soviet network of just provision of electricity and so forth. Uh, because that's just how it's going. That will be the only gamble that we have left after that. Okay, so let's switch to the grand strategy now. And my, my, my question will be uh, not an easy one. So what do you think is the game that the United States is playing? The United right States. Yes, United States is playing. And how... Does it fit how the unfolding events are fitting in with the grand strategy of the United States in this new era of great power competition, Eurasia? Uh, you know, I, I, I asked this question on purpose because on this particular day today, we're going to have, uh, you know, a meeting and conversation between Biden and Xi Jinping. Yes. So how does that all fit? What do you think? What is the, the U.S. grand strategy approach to, the, to this? So there's two points that I see happening at the moment from the United States. On the first point is that the, the Biden administration clearly understands that this is a moment of opportunity to uh, circle the wagons in Europe against all the enemies that Washington perceives because so many uh, European politicians who thought that there was a path to a long-term arrangement with Putin have been discredited, at least in the very short term, uh, the Biden administration is making a big push to not only turn the Europeans terminally against Moscow, but also try to get them suspicious of Beijing as well. Uh, whether or not that will succeed, we should have an answer in probably a month or two, because if the momentum is not sustained for two months, and it's definitely not going to last. 
Now, in terms of what this means in the medium to long term, assuming that this U.S. process continues to unfold, what we're beginning to see happen with the erection of huge sanctions barriers to Russian participation in the world market is that the United States seems confident, or at least is unintentionally seeming confident, that there is a way to create a new Euro-Atlantic trade space uh, that can resist the capitalist logic of a Eurasia that's open for business. And this is very different from the 1940s, uh, when the first cold, when the actual cold war. Yeah, and this is very Mackinderian thing. Yes, I mean, that's, that's where we're about to go here. So in the long telegram, of course, Kennan identifies that there's only four industrial centers of the world you really need to think about. But he's correct. It's at the time, it was North America, Western Europe, the Soviet Union, and then uh, Japan. And of those, two of them, are, well, three of them are ba basically destroyed at the end of the 1940s, they but they all ultimately reconstitute. Today, it's far more than four. And the fact is that however much um, there is a large market in the Euro-Atlantic area, uh, we really have, you would need to have all the economic actors within it consciously reject working with anyone working with Russia. Uh, now, obviously, the big, the sticking point here is China, but we're already seeing some cracks in how the U.S. strategy was supposed to function against China. The big one is India, which I think is uh, surprised me how rapidly it cracked, as India is clearly siding with the Chinese on an economic front in as much as they're going to sustain their own trade relations with Russia. Um, on a limited, to a limited extent, this makes sense right away. The Indians and the Russians have a very long strategic partnership. The Indians do not want energy prices to boil nearly as much as the Euro-Atlantic community can allow them to do so. Um, but the, the difficulty, the difficulty this raises, uh, is that the assumptions in Washington for a long time, uh, based on their discussions with Indian officials, is that in New Delhi there was perceived by Washington to be a view that Russia was in terminal decline for a strategic partnership. I think we can now say that that view was the result of selection bias among what Indian officials and Indian public intellectuals wanted to talk to Washington. In no small part because the community in Washington that studies India is much, much smaller than it is that studies Europe, Russia, or China. So if, if we're now operating in a world in which India is going to stay far closer, is not willing to break relations with Russia, and we can assume that with definitive status, um, then presumably the Eurasian economic space is going to stay open. If and it's a big if, China's remaining open to Russia means that the United States needs to increase sanctions pressure against China in order to actually punish Russia after a couple more months of uh, decline followed by stabilization inside the Russian Federation and a war continuing to churn in Ukraine. Then we are really going to see an attempt to carve the world into two. Um, and Though it's not inevitable at this point, I think the political pressure in the United States is going to be so high that it's going to be extremely difficult for a Biden administration and definitely for any subsequent Republican administration to resist, just putting up total barriers everywhere. And then the center of gravity entirely shifts to, does European business accept this? So America can pivot if it wants to, and I think there will be sufficient political pressure to make American business change. But I really do not know how long the Europeans are going to be up for living in a world in which uh, a, a Eurasia full of cheap resources and capital is just closed. And on top of that, as some people have already mentioned, if Russia and Ukraine are now at war and causing all sorts of trade difficulties and just straight up military logistical difficulties, how is that shock of loss of food going to royal the Middle East?
That's where it's actually going to cause serious instability if food is not flowing into the Middle East. Egypt right now, the government stability is basically propped up by the fact that bread is cheaper than the cost to make it. So if we really start to see serious political instability in the Middle East again, like in 2011, does this, does this require Europe to do, some, do something about it in the short term? And, put it absolutely bluntly. We know from experience that uh, Europeans are much less welcoming of refugees in that area than they are for Christian white people from Europe, from Ukraine. Yeah. But that's a long rant. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think that the, um, that the war and especially its conduct in Ukraine uh, serves well the, the, the grand strategy of the United States in Eurasia. Uh, uh, at least to the extent that we can predict now. First of all, it you know the Russian ground forces are being mowed down, yeah, basically. So the Russian Russia is being uh, attrited. The second thing is that the longer the uh, the the resistance lasts, the uh, the more vulnerable China becomes because of the European angle. Uh, the resistance of the, the heroic resistance of the Ukrainian military and the winning in the information warfare by, the, by Ukraine galvanized and reconsolidated the transatlantic community, uh, which was manifested by, by the Chancellor, by Chancellor Schultz's speech in the Bundestag. Of course, we will, it's still to be seen whether this will be, you know, confirmed by invoices and flows and energy and stuff, and you know, with Russia. But still, the, the, the major problem that the United States faced over the last three or even four years was that the, those damn Europeans didn't want to, to, to embark on the same train of, right. of, of decoupling from China or you know, imposing the rules of the road against China. And the, the, the war in Ukraine, close, quite close to Berlin, sort of pushed them to try to embark, I mean, push them towards embarking on the same train. So that's a great win for the U.S. Another great win is also that puts China in the corner. And the third is that it's uh, it's uh, weakening Russia extensively. Uh, now the question is, especially for the people here and where I'm speaking from, from Warsaw and elsewhere in the region, is whether the United States will move further and help create the, the real intermarium thing especially if Russia, for some reason, is defeated in the way it was defeated by the Japanese and, you know, in, in the war of 1904 and 5. Uh, and we, the United States could create a completely new balance of power in Eastern Europe, including the uh, new economic cooperation zone from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, where the United States could flow a lot of money in and create a more balanced Europe where it could hedge against the German idea of continental reconsolidation again. Yeah. So that would be perfectly and beautifully and brilliantly in line with Mackinder's thesis by creating this intermarium concept as a, as a security you know, guarantee, as a sort of a hedging against some ideas that the Germans might think about in French of you know, European continental consolidation with some sort of help from from Russia and cooperation with China, because you know you never know who's going to win this competition between China and U.S. So if the if the Americans play it well, and if uh, Russia is defeated, that might mean re-emergence of American hegemony in Eurasia, and from a surprisingly Western seaboard of Eurasia, not from the Western Pacific. Uh, because that would kill the Belt and Road Initiative and that could kill the, the Chinese dream of just producing a mass and flowing, overflowing Eurasia to the Western you know, edges of it with their goods. Uh, so, that, that would so, be a major win for the US, I, I guess. So that is the rosy scenario. But here's the other half of this that I, unfortunately is much darker. And I think this will cap off my thoughts on the whole process. In addition to all this, we have seen, not mostly because of the Ukraine conflict, but mostly because of China's behavior, that a whole first island chain near neighbors are really turning against China politically right now. 
So South Korea just elected a conservative who's almost certainly going to be a positive reintegrationist into U.S. security pact, uh, whereas Moon Jae-in really wanted to have at least some degree of proper autonomy, even with it, even though he still wanted to keep the alliance. Uh, Japan obviously has long been anti-China for a variety of reasons. Australia has been permanently bullied out of trying to find any uh, reconciliation with China, and the Philippines. Uh, was attempting to find a proper accommodation, but the entire Duterte gamble on that has failed. So we can probably assume that that's going to be moving against China relatively soon. If all of that is happening and the political pressure in the U.S. is rising to establish exactly what you said, a means of turning the Euro-Atlantic community not just against Russia, but also uh, finally killing the one belt, one road concept coming out of China, I think the entire international financial system that the Chinese have recognized is progressively sending capital into the People's Republic of China is going to stall. If that is stalled, then the logic of why Beijing really has been avoiding a war for the past 20, 30, 40 years begins to fall apart. Is Beijing going to be okay living in a world in which its economic progress is actively being constrained by popular will around the world, and it's enduring a whole bunch of political insults? My suspicion is that they've endured all the insults to this point, mostly because they continue to get rich for the people who are insulting them, so I think the joke's on them. But if that starts to reverse, then I think there's a very serious chance that the Chinese decide to begin reshaping the world and cast the iron dice. And if that happens, I'm very doubtful that the United States is going to have anything close to the amount of resources necessary to remake the European mm. model uh, anytime soon. Though on the plus side, I think you're absolutely right that even if the Russians do ultimately win a striking victory against the Ukrainians, which is looking less likely, but still in the cards, uh, the Russian ground forces are permanently invested in Ukraine for at least five years, probably more. So Russian power projection capability, I think we can safely assume is pretty much gone beyond very small token things showing up. Yeah. And so let's wrap it wrap up at this moment. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nicholas Myers, Jacek Bartoszak, Strategy in Future. Uh, stay with us for more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.